I think the most robust ADAS systems out there are considered level two. Level four is considered uh, full autonomy under certain conditions. What is Rivian going for? So Rivian's actually going for level three. So autonomous driving in certain conditions in certain geofenced areas where we actually take over the entire driving operation of the vehicle in a fail-safe manner. So what is Rivian's approach and how are you going to ensure that, that there's some safety there? We're building a driver monitoring system that is made up of multiple components. So it's not just one sensor like a torque input sensor that would detect if the driver wants to actually disengage the longitudinal or lateral controller. There's a driver monitoring camera and there's also going to be um, hands-on wheel sensors. To me, the, the biggest issue with DMS is not just um, that it's monitoring the driver, but what kind of either corrective or preventative behavior, so. That's a good point. It's really trying to determine the driver's intention because if you've enabled the autonomous system and you're on the highway and you've pulled out your iPad and you're watching a movie and you kind of have it on your lap, say you want to turn and get your notebook out or put that away and get a book and you inadvertently give it a steering input to the steering controller, and it senses torque, the driver monitoring camera will see that you're not looking at the road and you also don't have both hands on the wheel. So we'll have to ignore that input from the human to, to understand that they're not, they're not intending to change lanes. They're actually just doing something else while the vehicle's in control. And then on the flip side, it's important to know that the driver is actually ready to re-engage in the driving task. So say you're approaching your planned exit, a minute before that, the vehicle will notify the driver through HMI that it's time to get ready to drive, be aware of your surroundings, and then we'll detect both hands on the wheel, the inputs of the steering controller match the algorithms, and the driver's eyes are on the road. My job specifically is going on adventures to meet people who are mountain biking, who are surfing, who are rock climbing. I flew down to North Carolina and showed up at this overlanding conference with a couple of like generative research tools, which basically allows the people that I'm talking to to kind of co-create with me as we're talking. So, you know, it's asking what are the tools that you brought specifically for Overland? What are the biggest problems? Working together on those problems. And then it's also just being a part of the community. So um, because I was there alone, there was a lot of people that invited me into their campsite and were like, hey, you know, do you want this ground beef burrito? Everyone was making ground beef burritos on this trip. I probably ate like seven. Um, but yeah, and then just sitting and having conversations about their vehicle, what overlanding means to them. So give me an example of, or um, the, either a design element in the exist one of the two existing models that you either contributed to or came directly out of your research. I designed the crossbars. One of the biggest things is just realizing that it's super annoying to like set up your vehicle before every single trip because there's a lot that needs to be attached and or taken off so that you don't have this huge rack on the back of your vehicle, right. things like that. And so one of the things that we did was we made it a quick release system. So there's ports on the entire vehicle or along the entire vehicle spaced 36 inches apart. The crossbar system is modular so that you can undo one of those crossbars, take it off, throw it in your garage. It seems simple. A lot of people at the shows, when I'm talking to them, are like, why has no one done this before? Partly it's because we have this really great ecosystem of the vehicles, but also partly it's because there's very few automotive manufacturers where the process is ingrained this deep, right? Where no, we, before we design anything, we have to go out and talk to people who do those things and understand it. Why pursue level three? Why can't that just be achieved with level two? Because level three is harder. We want to embrace the challenge in a sense. And OEMs, you see that they're, they're, they've been adding some um, automation to certain controls of the car for years now with cruise control and then adaptive cruise control and then lane departure warning. And you're seeing these features come together and provide more and more driving features taken over by the vehicle. We're building a consumer product. We want people to use it. We want them to love it. 
if we can give back some of that commute time, some of that drive time to them to unwind or to engage in something else while the vehicle's kind of on that daily commute or you know, you want to hang with your friends and check out pictures and swap them while you're driving home from a climb or something like that. Um, we want to enable that for, for our customers. And there are mobility companies working on level four and they're looking at it kind of from the top down, coming from four and five for more fleet applications possibly. So we want to get a feature in our customers' hands sooner than possibly some of those other systems might be fully vetted for wide adoption.